Hello everyone, thank you so much for registering on this particular course which is Mastering Azure Data Engineering. I'll be your mentor Maruti Makwana for this particular course and we are going to take you through the journey of Azure Data Engineering with various uh, Azure related services like Azure Synapse, Azure Databricks, Azure Data Lakes, Azure Data Factory and uh, there are a couple of things which are associated with all the services. We are also going to focus on a couple of databases like SQL Server Database or Cosmos DB which is a cloud specific database of Microsoft Azure. This full course is going to be totally focusing on Azure Data Engineering and it is also going to focus on the certification exam course which is DP203. So if you are planning for the certification or if you are eager to learn Azure Data Engineering associated with this kind of services then you are at the right place. This video course is going to take you through the step by step journey. Before we start anything about the course, let me introduce myself. My name is Maruti Makwana and I'm a corporate trainer from last almost 16 plus years of experience. I'm a Microsoft certified trainer and I'm in this industry with Azure expertization from last almost 10 years actually. I have trained various corporate employees and number of tech giants actually. And uh, I've trained various employees of tech giants and then I'm helping them in cloud architecture designing and other things. Now that's it for me. Let's focus on this particular course and what extra things which are required for this. As I told you, this data engineering course is focusing on Azure related data engineering and specialized on DP203. So this particular exam is actually planned for getting the Azure Data Engineer Associate Batch. So you will get Microsoft Certified Azure Data Engineering Associate kind of batch if you clear this exam. Now those who are already planning for DP203 or they are already data engineers working on Azure Cloud, they can actually go through this course and this is going to be the perfect choice for them. But yes, those who are not very familiar with Azure Cloud or those who are very very newbie into this one, I should strongly recommend that uh, you should go through my other course which is DP900. For your kind information, DP900 is Microsoft Azure Data Fundamentals and I strongly recommend that you go through this small shortest 3 hours course actually which is actually taking you to the journey of data concepts, what kind of relational and non-relational data is available in Azure and then how you can deal with the modern data warehousing. Once you go through this course, you will have the basic idea about the data associated with Azure Cloud and then you can directly jump on DP203 which is actually the official course for Azure Data Engineering. In this particular course, if you go to the official exam page, Microsoft is going to tell you that we are focusing on this kind of four skills. So they are going to measure this kind of skills which are focusing on design and implementing the data storage which is having the highest weightage no doubt. Design and develop data processing, design and implement data security and then finally monitoring and optimizing the data storage and data processing. Throughout this particular course we are going to focus on this kind of skills only and we are going to make sure that you are able to understand the concept as well as you are able to implement this thing step by step. This full course is going to be much much more advanced than the official a learning path which is given by Microsoft. I know that most people are preferring to go through the learning path of Microsoft which is a very good thing but this is something which is going to be your beginning or I can say very basic kind of introduction of the data associated with Azure. In this course we are going to focus on little bit intermediate to advanced kind of thing and that's why this is not something which is preferable for total novice users and that's what exactly which is mentioned here also. So you can see Microsoft is also mentioning that this is not for the novice user. If you have dealt with data, if you have dealt with Azure Cloud, then maybe this is going to be the right choice for you. Now before you take a decision to enroll in this particular course, I want to tell you one thing that there are two prerequisites which are required for this particular course. One, I already told you that you need to have the knowledge of the basic data fundamentals actually. So if you have not gone through that, I strongly recommend you go and register DP900 course right now on mentorstack.com or otherwise. The second prerequisite which you have to go through is actually this one. Obviously to do all the practical steps and hands on of this particular course you need to have an Azure subscription. If you have a valid Azure subscription which is given by your organization that is perfect. If you don't have then there are two different ways to get the Azure subscription. The first one is actually this one which is available on azure.microsoft.com. This is the official website of Azure and here you can get the free Azure subscription which will come with $200 of Azure credit with 30 days of usage limitation in that. And this gives you a couple of services which are actually paid. 
but for your kind of information this is one of the subscription which is not giving you Azure Databricks cluster development kind of thing. So if you are focusing on Azure Databricks much more in depth and if you want to do the practicals of this particular course with Azure Databricks then this subscription is not going to work out. So if you are planning for Azure Databricks in depth with practical kind of thing then in spite of this free Azure subscription you should go with something which is known as Microsoft Azure Pass. This Azure Pass is also nothing but another variety of Azure subscription which is offered by Microsoft. But this is something which mostly you cannot get free of course. You can get it from my kind of official trainers or maybe when you attend any kind of Microsoft trainings which we deliver for the companies. If you are joining for any yearly membership of MentorStack.com, you will get this kind of Azure Pass sponsorship free of cost. So if you have already registered for MentorStack.com premium memberships, you can just connect me with that and we will provide one Azure Pass to you which will be valid for 30 days with 100 Azure US dollar of credit in which all the Azure services are available which include couple of DevOps services, Azure Data Bricks kind of services and all the services of Azure Data Engineering including Synapse and all. All the services will be coming into this particular pass. All you have to do is you just have to go to mentorstack.com and you have to register yourself and just provide a proof through email to our official email ID which is mentorstack at gmail.com or info at the red mentorstack.com. So you can use this email ID or you can WhatsApp your payment screenshot on this particular WhatsApp number and we will provide an Azure Pass subscription to you. That's it. If you already have a subscription, if you are already registered in mentorstack.com, this is perfect. You can start your journey with DP203 and I will take you to this journey by hand holding, by doing all the practical steps, practically step by step during this course. Thank you. Okay, now we reach to that particular module which is a very important part of Azure Data Engineering and that is Azure Synapse Analytics. I'm sure this is one of the most popular services of Azure so that's why you have surely heard about Azure Synapse Analytics word. But if you don't know what is this then in this particular video I'm going to explain couple of things about that. First of all, let me tell you one thing, Azure Synapse Analytics is one of the service which is actually a full-fledged package of couple of features and services included inside that. It's not a one single thing, it is a package of multiple things. Like if you have heard about something called Azure Synapse SQL, then that is actually nothing but a data warehousing configuration. It's a data warehouse with a data virtualization kind of configuration inside that and that is giving you a full-fledged SQL Server data warehouse. If you heard about Apache Spark integration with Synapse, then that is something which is known as Azure Synapse Spark clusters and uh, Azure Synapse Spark. Now when you go with this kind of thing, this is giving you a full-fledged Spark cluster configuration with Spark notebooks which you can run and you can do data engineering with that. You also have a serverless and dedicated variations of Synapse SQL. You can use your choice of languages like you can execute SQL queries in Synapse or you can also use Python, .NET, Java, Scala or even command line interface with that. This is actually one particular utility which is allowing you to do data integration, data analytics, data visualization, data virtualization, all these things are added at one particular place. Not only that, this platform is allowing you to manage your data, secure your data, monitor your data pipelines and you can also create meta stores associated with this. This is one complete package which is actually solving your end-to-end -end data analytics problems. On top of your Azure Data Lake Storage which we have already seen Data Lake Storage Gen 2, they have created Azure Synapse Analytics and that is one basic requirement of Synapse Analytics that every time when you're dealing with Synapse Analytics you need to have a ADLS Gen 2. You, have to, you need to have Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 associated with that. Combinedly, this Azure Synapse Analytics is actually made of five things. There are five different products which are coming with this. If you are not familiar with this kind of product name, just compare it with your Microsoft Office. Like when someone asks me what is Microsoft Office Maruti, I always say it is actually a combination of Microsoft Word, then Excel, then PowerPoint, then maybe a couple of other tools which are there. Now this kind of package which is creating four or five products is going to be one thing, that is Microsoft Office. 
And same way here also, Azure Synapse Analytics is actually having five things inside that. We have something which is known as Synapse SQL, which is nothing but exactly similar to data warehousing. This is actually data warehousing associated with SQL Server database, which allows you to store and query data in a structured way. Then we have Synapse pipelines, which are exactly same like your Azure Data Factory. Yes, of course, it's 95% same. There are 5% changes which I will show you when we use Synapse pipelines. But Synapse pipelines is 95% is same like Azure Data Factory. Whatever ETL transformation you have done in Azure Data Factory, you can do it here. Then we have something which is Azure Synapse Link, which gives you hybrid transactional analytical processing, which is formerly known as HTAP. If you heard about OLAP, we'll see uh, something newer than that with the help of Synapse Link, which is known as HTAP. We have fourth one, which is Synapse Studio. The Synapse Studio is very much similar to your Azure Data Factory Studio. But yes, this is having so many features associated with this. So if you want to deal with Synapse SQL or Synapse Pipeline or Synapse Link, you have to go to Synapse Studio first, where you have a fully developed integrated IDE available in that. And that is actually going to give you all those tools which you can use and configure. Last but not the least, we have something which is known as Synapse Spark, which is exactly similar kind of concept to your Azure Data Bricks, which you have already seen. This is one of the reasons we kept the Synapse Analytics at the somewhere at the end of this particular course, actually, because before this, you already know Data Factory. Before this, you already know Data Bricks, And that's a perfect timing, actually. Now it's a time for you to understand Synapse Analytics so that you can not only understand Synapse Analytics, you can also compare this with whatever you have already learned. This is going to be a, one of the tough questions for you guys, which one you have to use at what kind of requirement. And that's why this is a very important concept to understand. These five products, when you understand, you will have a basic knowledge of Azure Synapse Analytics. And that is a time you have to explore more with that. We will see each one of the tool of Synapse Analytics one by one. But right now, it's a time to create our first Synapse Analytics. So we'll go to Azure portal and we'll create one Azure Synapse Analytics with one ADLS Gen 2. Let's do that. Okay, now you can see I'm there in my Azure portal. I have already clicked on create resource and then inside this create resource page, if I click on analytics, exactly somewhere below the data bricks and all, we have something which is Azure Synapse Analytics. I want to click on this Azure Synapse Analytics and then uh, we are going to create our first Synapse Analytics now. I'll select my subscription. I select my resource group, which is training RG. There is one resource group which is extra required with Synapse, which is actually for the managed resources. So I'm just giving a name of the resource group, Managed RG. Managed RG is going to be a new resource group, which is going to be empty right now. It's not going to have any resources inside that. It's going to be empty. But yeah, if you want to add on some resources here to manage by Synapse, then you can add it there. Name of the workspace, I'm giving Maruti Synapse WS for workspace with some number like 788, which is fine. The location for the Synapse, I'm going to select East US. And then uh, they are asking me that you need to have one Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 account associated with that. I have my ADLS Gen 2, which I've already used in my other videos of this particular course. So I'm going to select the same one. And then inside that, they are saying that we need to have one file system container. This is going to be the default container of the Synapse Analytics workspace. I'm going to create a new container for this and I'm giving this is Maruti FS container. FS container is my file system container. And why I'm creating new container? Because for this particular container, now they are going to associate some kind of a roles and permissions to, to my particular Synapse analytics actually. So a contributor role will be associated with this workspace in this container so that we can manage everything inside that. All these configurational things that we can do manually also. If you want to manually do this thing, then you can uncheck this, but I'm going to take it automatically right now. So we are going to assign this kind of roles. We are fine with that. And then I'm going to click on next. Every Synapse workspace is going to come with one default SQL server, which is going to be serverless. And for that SQL server, actually, you have to provide a SQL server admin username and password. I am providing a SQL admin username and password. This is going to be useful for my dedicated and serverless SQL pool both. But as of now, we'll not have any dedicated SQL pool. We will have just a serverless SQL pool at the end of the deployment. So that is fine. I'm providing some username and password. Remember, I can also use Azure Active Directory for authentication, but that's okay. Right now I'm using SQL administrations. That's fine. 
I'm going to click on next, next, next. I do not want to change anything. I think we will go with the default deployments of whatever is there in Synapse workspace. And this deployment will take some time. And then once this process is done, it's going to it's going to give me one Synapse workspace. And uh, inside that Synapse workspace, as I told you, by default, you will have one serverless SQL pool. So th they are showing me that the cost of this Synapse is right now only 360 rupees, which is there, because, which is actually a cost of the serverless SQL pool. Other things in Synapse, when you create, then it's going to charge you. Otherwise, it's not going to charge you right now. So no dedicated SQL pool, no Spark clusters, no notebooks, nothing will be there. It's going to be empty. Only one serverless SQL pool will be there. What is the use of that serverless SQL pool? Well, that also you will get to know in the coming videos. But as of now, we are fine with this. The deployment is in progress. Very soon this will be done. And then what I'm going to do inside that, that is something which I'm going to show you in my next video. Stay tuned. Okay, in our previous video, we have deployed one Azure Synapse Analytics and now you can see it's showing me on screen that it's deployed. Let me click on go to resource group and it's going to show me that it has actually created one Synapse Analytics which is connected with my Gen2 storage account. So this is what which is there. I'm going into my Synapse workspace. This is showing me, okay, I made a mistake actually. Uh, in spite of P, I type O, sorry for that, but that's okay. My typing is not very good. Uh, I can just see one thing that this is Synapse Workspace which is successfully deployed and somewhere inside this same like Azure Data Factory we have a button here which is showing me that I can open Synapse Studio. When I click on this open Synapse Studio it's going to open this thing in the new tab and this is actually very similar to Azure Data Factory Studio but this is something which is a very enhanced version of that because it's not only having a pipeline related thing it's actually having something for data warehousing something for data engineering of my notebook something which is associated with power bi so so many things are there here um, you can see uh, the workspace is open this is my synapse studio left side i have home data develop integrate monitor and manage more options are there if i go to integrate this is a section where you will find everything similar to your data factory because here you can create pipeline link connections and all those things i can click on pipeline I can get almost similar kind of controls here. So you can see, except this first one, which is Synapse, my copy data activity, my beta explorer functions, everything is same actually. I just have one separate new section here, which is actually for Synapse. And this is allowing me to integrate Synapse notebooks with my pipelines. If I go to this section, which is data, the data is going to show me that, uh, let me close the pipeline. The data is going to show me that we have workspace and linked sources associated with this. The workspace is not having any database right now, so it's not showing many database. But if I go to linked one, this is going to show me that yes, you have one linked data source which is connected with this, which is Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2. This is the one which we have connected while creating the Synapse workspace. If I expand the Synapse workspace name, then it's showing me that you have FS container, you have your big data container, two containers are there. And this is your primary container in which you have all the rights actually. So suppose if I have some files inside this, I can deal with those files. I can write some queries with those files also. That's perfectly doable. If I go to this uh, left side section, which is actually develop, the develop part is actually helping me to create my kind of SQL scripts and my kind of notebooks, which can be based on Python or C Sharp or Java kind of things. I can click on this plus icon. And you can see that it's showing me I can create a new SQL script. I can generate a new KQL script. KQ is ten custo query language, like this is structured query language. And then we have uh, notebooks, we have data flows. You can create all those things. You can create SQL script and then you can write some script here. The moment you execute script, you can select which database you want to associate. And then um, as of now, I do not have any dedicated SQL pool here. So it's just showing me that, okay, you do not have any dedicated SQL pool, but you have one serverless SQL pool, which is built in serverless pool, which is already given with this Synapse workspace actually. So that's why this is visible here. I can execute some queries here and then I can associate with the master database of my built in serverless pool actually. So that is what which is coming here by default. 
Now, if you ask me, where is this serverless SQL pool created? Well, that is something which is visible in your Azure portal. In this Azure portal, you can see we have a section called SQL pools. And then I have some built-in pool, which is a serverless one right now. So that is something which is there. If I want to create a dedicated SQL pool, there is a button here by which I can create a new dedicated SQL pool. Or if I want to create an Apache Spark pool to run my notebooks, I can do that also. All those features are coming under one umbrella. And that is something which is known as Azure Synapse Studio. We have a similar kind of monitoring and manage sections also here. Now, if I go to monitor, this is going to show me all the pipeline executions or some Spark pool executions also with that. I can also click on manage, which has some more configuration features here associated with security, associated with DevOps, associated with Spark pools and SQL pools here. So all these configurations we are going to see, we are going to use in this particular video courses. So step by step in each and every video when I'm going to use Synapse, I am going to use Synapse Studio and I will configure a couple of things with this step by step. As of now, this is it. I think, I hope you understood what is your Synapse Studio is all about and this is what it is. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next video. Okay, so now it's the time to see Azure Synapse SQL in which we are going to focus on dedicated SQL Server first. You can see right now I'm still with the same Synapse workspace which I have created in the previous video. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to create a new dedicated SQL pool first. If you have a question, what is this dedicated SQL pool? Well, just hang on. I'm going to explain that thing. But before I do that thing, I just want you to create one new dedicated SQL pool with me so that we can execute some queries inside that. And then we can see that how this data warehousing engine is actually working. Let me click on new dedicated SQL pool. I'm going to provide some meaningful name. Let's say I'm going to specify that name of this pool is my SQL D pool dedicated pool with some number like 22 something like that is showing me one more configurational option here which is like performance level now actually performance level of this dedicated SQL pool is very important configuration because based on this you will be able to understand what kind of computational power is going to be associated with this dedicated pool as of now, I'm choosing the minimum computational power, which is DW100C. Remember, the range is starting from 100C to 30,000C actually. This particular one is actually performance level, which is very important to understand. So we have the one link available on the portal, which I want to keep it open. This particular link I'll go through very soon. And then I'll show you that what this table is actually trying to tell you about the data warehouse units. But yes, right now I'm selecting 100 DWC, which is data warehouse units. That's perfectly fine. It's showing me the cost per hour for this dedicated SQL pool is going to be 108 Indian rupees, which is fine for me right now. I'm going to start the deployment of this thing without any other configurational changes. So I'm just going to click on review and create. And then I'm going to click on create. This dedicated SQL pool is going to take some time. But while this is deploying, actually, let's understand what is this actually. And let's try to focus on the conceptual part of this. So Azure Synapse SQL is actually distributed query system that enables you to implement data warehousing and data virtualization scenarios using your standard T SQL experience familiar to data engineers. Now, this is a very important line. And this is telling you that whenever you're going to execute any SQL queries inside this, these are going to be a standard transactional SQL queries only. But these queries are going to be meant for data warehousing and data virtualization. That's why whenever you're going to execute this query, it is going to be distributed query system. It means it is going to be utilizing that query in the distributed manner. So your tables are going to have distributions and your each query is going to be executing with some distributed computer associated with that. Synapse SQL offer both serverless and dedicated resource models. That's what we know. That's the reason we have created dedicated SQL pool right now. And then later on, we're going to see serverless SQL pool also. If you are looking for a predictable performance and cost, then you have to create a dedicated SQL pool to reserve your processing power for data sources in SQL tables. And that's what we have done right now. Suppose you have some unplanned or ad hoc workload kind of requirement, and then you don't know what kind of compute you need for that then you can always use the always available 
SQL Server, which is serverless actually. So you can use the serverless SQL pool endpoint at that time, which is already available in your Synapse. Now before we proceed with this, we need to understand something which is known as Synapse SQL architecture. And this leverage a scale-out architecture to distribute computational processing of data across multiple nodes. This architecture is having multiple nodes inside that where each node is nothing but some kind of a computer with a SQL Server installed inside that. If I be very specific, then I'll tell you that each node is nothing but a virtual machine which is going to have SQL Server installed inside this. Compute is separate from storage. That's what independently scalable actually. And Synapse SQL, which is using this node-based architecture, is actually allowing you to associate with two kind of nodes. The one is known as control node and the other one is known as compute nodes. In every architecture of Synapse SQL, you are going to have only one control node, which is actually going to take your queries, which will be in the tree SQL queries, which will be taken care by control node. So it's going to take your queries either from application or user, and then it's going to try to execute those queries. But then this is a control node which is going to take the query. It's not going to execute by itself. Control node is going to distribute this particular query using the distributed query engine and then this is going to be executed parallelly in all the compute nodes which are available. And in this architecture, you are always going to have one control node and multiple compute nodes. If I try to focus on the data warehousing architecture with dedicated SQL pools, then it's going to look like this. You can see on this diagram that we have one you can see on this diagram that we have one dedicated SQL pool and inside this dedicated SQL pool we have something which is massive parallel processing engine which is formerly known as MPP engine in which we have one control node and multiple compute nodes. As I said control node and compute node both are computers like a virtual machines with dedicated SQL server installed inside that. Control node will take your queries from either application and users and then it's going to distribute that to available multiple compute nodes. Multiple compute nodes are going to have dedicated SQL Server with that, so it's going to execute the query in a distributed way. And every time when you want to execute any query, it will be divided into parts, and then each part will be executed by an independent compute node. That's how the query execution is going to be parallel. If you ask me what is the range of this compute node, how many compute nodes can be there? In every dedicated SQL pool, one control node and either one to 60, one to 60, the range of the compute nodes are going to be minimum one compute node is going to be there or maximum 60 compute node can be there and that is what the architectural structure is all about. Now whenever we are going to execute this query and then how many compute nodes are going to be there, that is something which is based on my data warehousing unit. As you know, we have selected DW100C. If I go to that web page which I kept open from Microsoft documentation, this is showing me that if you have DW100C, then this is going to have only one compute node. It means this is a bare minimum configuration of this, which is going to have one control node and one compute node only. Suppose if I want parallel processing and more distributions associated with that, then I can go with the higher DWC, which can go up to maximum, which is DW30,000C, in which we have 60 compute nodes. It means this is a maximum capacity of this data warehouse. One control node and 60 compute nodes will be there in which the queries are going to be distributed. When you're going to use this distributions, actually every query is going to be distributed based on something which is known as distributions. Now if you ask me what is a distribution actually? Well that is also another important concept which you need to understand in order to understand this particular structure. So let's say if I want to focus on distributions, then the definition says that a distribution is a basic unit of storage and processing for parallel queries that runs on a distributed data. In dedicated SQL pool, when dedicated SQL pool runs a query, the work is divided into 60 smaller queries that are going to execute parallelly. Each of the 60 smaller queries are going to run on one of the data distributions. Each compute node manage one or more of 60 distributions associated with that. It means now this being brings me to one particular conclusion that every time if I have only one compute node, then all the 60 distributions are going to be executed in, in that particular compute node only. Same way if I have two compute nodes, then it's going to divide them into 50-50. So 30 distributions will be executed in one compute node and another 30 will be distributed in another one. Same way if I go to 10 different compute nodes where 10 different 
parallel processing are going to happen then each compute node is going to have six distributions associated with that and total will be always 60. 60 distributions are there maximum capacity of the compute nodes are also going to be 60 so if I go to the maximum capacity every compute node will have one distribution and that's going to be 60 times more capable more performance than a normal SQL server which you can get. This is what which is an architecture of the Synapse SQL dedicated pool and how it is working and how it's improving performance that totally depends on how many compute nodes you have selected and then what kind of distributions you have in your table. We have distributions like round robin, hash and replicate table kind of things which we can decide and then we can create in our table and then after that using these distributions we will be able to execute our queries parallelly. As of now, if I go back to my dedicated SQL pool, it's still showing me in progress. If I wait for a few moments, it will be done. And then if this deployment is done, then I'm going to start executing queries inside that. That's what we are going to see in the next video. Stay tuned. Okay, so now my dedicated SQL pool is actually completely deployed. You can see right now it's showing me your deployment is complete. I'll click on go to resource and then it's showing me that uh, yes, my dedicated SQL pool is actually listed in this particular list. So this is available with DW100C. Anytime if I want to change the configuration of the dedicated SQL pool or if I want to scale it, I can go inside this and I can scale it. Or if I'm not using this anymore, then I can pause this also which can stop the costing of this dedicated SQL pool actually. I'm not doing anything for me my dedicated SQL pool is up and running so let's go to the Synapse workspace. I want to click on data and then I want to focus on this workspace tab if it is showing me my dedicated SQL pool database or not. For you if it is not showing it's a quite common issue actually you can refresh your full browser in the Synapse studio and then it's going to show you that dedicated SQL pool database. You can see for me it's refreshed and it's showing me now in SQL database I have one database actually. If I expand this, this is going to be my dedicated SQL pool database. Is it having any tables inside that? Well obviously right now it's not going to have any tables inside that but it is actually going to have some system views inside this. Because this is not a normal SQL server database, it's a data warehouse. This is going to show you that we have some system views which we can use whenever we want to deep dive into this data warehousing. Anytime when any query is executing actually, if I want to see that which node is used, what kind of tables are using inside that, what kind of meta stores are getting generated in the background with the metadata details of this particular query executions, all the things I can get if I deep dive into all the system views. I am going to show you some queries with the system views right now. So let's see how it is going to work. But yes, this is what which we have right now. We have a dedicated SQL pool which is my data warehousing and then this is having no tables right now. Let me create and execute some queries on this so that we can get some tables. So I'm going to create a new empty script right now. In the right side section it's showing me that I'm connected to my dedicated SQL pool and this is using this database which is created inside that. Let me execute my first query which is going to create a very simple table initially. So I'm going to create one table which is with this particular query. I copy pasted this query and let me just show you what I have done inside this. I'm creating one table which is actually having three columns inside that. Order ID, order date and order description. Every time we are going to have a default column value for order description which is like new order. And when I'm creating this table, I am intentionally specifying that this particular table is actually going to have distribution of that which is of type round robin. Now for your kind of information guys, when we are dealing with this particular tables, we have two kind of distributions. We have round robin distribution and we have hash distribution. Round robin is going to allow me to distribute my records randomly and evenly. Which means that if one particular distribution is trying to insert or work on one particular record, the moment the distribution is free, the one same distribution can actually process multiple records with that. We'll see this thing in action once we execute some insert statement on this particular table. So my first query is very simple. If I run this query, it's going to show me that the query is executed successfully within few seconds. 
and then if I expand this tables kind of section I will be able to see that I have one table which is actually dbo.orders and this dbo.orders table is going to show me that I have three columns inside that. This is my table which is actually having round robin distributions with that. Once this table is created I want to insert some records inside this and I do not want to insert manually one by one record I want to insert multiple records in one shot. That's the reason I have created one more query. If you see I have declared one integer variable on the top which is i and then I'm setting the initialize value of the i which is 1. I'm declaring one more variable which is date which is of type date time and then I'm going to set some particular date with that. After configuring this thing I'm actually going to set up one while loop where I'm just specifying that this while loop is going to execute 60 times and then during the 60 executions is actually going to insert 111 record every time with the increment of value of i. Every time when I'm inserting the 60 records inside this particular query I am just making sure that the date which I am inserting into this particular table is going to be same. You can see I'm not changing anything in the date. The default date which I'm giving is going to be 4th of February 2017 and that's the one which is going to be used throughout this query execution. Once this is like this, let me run this query. This query is going to be executed right now on this dedicated SQL pool with the very limited computer associated with that. Because we have selected the minimum performance configuration of DWC which is 100C. So let's wait for some time. It's going to take some time, few seconds. You can see that in the bottom bar is showing me that this is taking few seconds of time right now. Once this is done, we will move forward and we'll see that uh, what kind of configuration we have done. I hope you agree with me that this is going to insert 60 records with a different kind of order ID but similar kind of order date and description. Yes, my query is executed. It took around 39 seconds to execute this thing and obviously 60 records are inserted with that. If I try to do select star from table name, I'll get, be able to see those 60 records. I do not want to get those records because the data of the record is not important for me. What is more important for me is what kind of distribution they have used when they have inserted this data. And that is something which I want to know from my another query which I'm going to share it with you right now. This query is actually selecting some particular rows and some columns actually from this particular section. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to apply some joins. And these joins are not happening on my tables, these joins are happening on my system views which are already created inside this particular data warehousing. If you see this query, I'm trying to apply one, two and three joins actually. Each join is allowing me to map my node ID kind of column with that and it's allowing me to see what kind of node ID is actually going to be used while executing this query. You can see here on the top we have four columns which we are focusing right now. We are focusing on table name which will be obviously orders. We are focusing on node ID which should be same right now because we are using only one node ID. This is going to be my compute node ID and then we have a distribution ID which should be obviously starting from 1 to 60. It should be the range of that and then with each distribution how many rows are going to be processed. That is something which I want to see and that's why I'm taking this thing from the node partition table. This full configurational views and the query which I'm executing is going to show me the details for orders table and then it's going to show me the distribution order by distribution ID and then it's going to show me all the things order by distribution ID which is going to make sense. Let's execute this query. It's taking time. The query is executed. You can see I got some table and chart kind of section here. The table is showing me that we have four columns and you can see right now the table name is orders. The node ID which is used here is actually 50. When you execute this query you can get any different ID with this but the rule is in all the records you're going to have only one same ID because everything is getting executed in one single node. And then if you see the distribution wise we have 60 distributions so we have starting from 1 to 60 which is actually visible here and then if you focus on the number of rows processed with these distributions then you will understand that some distributions are actually processing no rows. In that we have zero. While there are some distributions which are actually processing three records, two records, three records. So it means there are chances that some distributions are actually going to insert one record and then they are going to be free again and then they are going to insert one more record with that. So there are a few distributions which are 
randomly getting a chance again 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 and then there are few which are not even getting a single chance and that's why they are not inserting any rows. This is how round robin works. Now if you want to know how a hash distribution is going to work I am going to show you that thing very soon but that simply means that this is something which is round robin one so you should be clear with this first. Now obviously this thing is very very straightforward that if I try to utilize this thing now once this query is executed I want to try few more things actually so let me just quickly execute three queries now I'm going to remove this query and I'm going to create my three queries first query is I'm going to create one more table I'm going to create one more table which is actually orders two table this is another table which I'm creating the only difference which is there is this time is orders two table is actually going to have distribution which is hash and this time I am specifying that my hash column is going to be order date. Now remember guys when you create a hash based table you have to specify one hash column. Logically the hash column has to be the one which is going to have some unique distinct values associated with the table. Now in this case order date is not going to be the one which is going to have the unique values every time. But still I'm putting it order date just to understand that how the hash distribution is actually working. Logically if I want to do this thing in the realistic database then I should do this thing with my order ID because logically order ID is the one which is going to be different every time. But intentionally just to understand this thing I'm putting it like this is going to be order date. I'm going to execute this query and this table is going to be created very quickly. Yes it is showing me within a second it is executed. If I refresh this section, I'm going to get one more table now, which is dbo.orders2. Same like my previous query, I want to insert some 60 records inside this orders2 also. So I'm going to execute my second query, which is actually inserting data. But this time, the only difference is I want to insert records into the table, which is having a name orders2. So in this also, I'm going to insert 60 records. Everything else is actually same. Let me run this query. This is going to insert 60 records into orders2 table. And if this is inserting 60 records into orders2 table, I want to execute the third query also, which should show me a distribution ID and number of rows processed by each distribution. So let me just execute this. If this execution is completed, we'll execute our third query. Remember, compared to the first query, the only difference this time is this is not round robin, this is hash distribution. And we need to see that how this hash distribution is actually performing. Query executed successfully within 39 seconds, almost similar kind of time. 60 records are inserted with this. Now this query I'm removing and I'm saying that I want to see the distribution, order ID, all those things actually into this one. For one table, the name of the table is going to be orders2. This is also a same query which I have executed earlier, but this time the only thing which I'm changing is the name of the table. When I want to see this query for orders2 table, let's see that what is coming here. You can see I'm getting same kind of details. We have table name which is orders2. We have a node ID which is going to be same for all 60 records which is 50 because we still have only one node. Distributions ID are going to be start from 1 to 60 but somewhere in one of the distribution we have all 60 rows which are processed. It means this time the execution was totally different. This time actually it's not like multiple distributions are randomly and evenly getting a chance to insert the record. This time because the hash column is actually order date and because we have same value in that order date column every time the same distribution ID is going to be used. So it's like this is the only one distribution which is playing an important role to execute this query and that's why all the rows, all 60 rows are actually executed by the same distribution. I know logically this is illogical actually. If I give my hash column as order ID then maybe my distributions are going to have different different records associated with that. But this is just to show you that based on the hash column this is going to do the distribution and based on that is going to process the rows. That's why deciding which kind of distribution in the table and what kind of column will be the right hash column is a very important thing to understand. Before we proceed let me try one more thing. These are the two different tables which we have created. I want to create actually one more table. This table is going to be again with the name orders but this is going to be orders 3 actually. Let me just do it once again. I'm going to create my one more table. This new table is actually going to be orders 3 table. Everything is same. This is going to have a round robin distribution. It means very much similar to the first table actually. I'm going to execute this. But this time 
before inserting any records into this orders three table actually I want to do one thing so this table is executed this query is executed and if I refresh this this is going to show me orders three table but the orders three table is actually empty right now this is not having any kind of records inside that before I add any records inside this what I'm going to do is I'm going to scale my dedicated SQL pool so I'm going into the scale section and I'm saying from DW100C I want to scale this to DW1000C. Remember as per this table when you go to DW1000C this is going to be a scale out architecture where horizontal scaling is going to happen and now I'm going to have one more compute node associated with this. So it's not going to be only one compute node it's going to be two this time. If I scale out this thing to DW1000C and then if I save it this is going to take some time. This is something which is a scaling process which is initiated and during the scaling process you won't be able to execute any query here. So because the scaling is actually undergo right now I should not be able to execute any queries here. It's going to show me a warning here that dedicated SQL pool is right now scaling. So please wait. Once scaling is done then we can proceed and we can execute further queries and let's wait for a few minutes. It will be done within I think three to four minutes. Okay, my dedicated pool is actually now scaled, so you can see it's showing me scaled here. And if that is done, then let's go back to this particular query section. And uh, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to execute my third query, but this time I'm going to execute this thing for my orders 3 table. Let me copy that query, let me put it here. And now I'm going to change the name of the table to orders 3. This third query is actually going to execute this particular section and is actually going to now in this section we are going to execute our second query first and we are going to insert some records same like what we have done in the first two tables I'm copying my second query pasting it here the table name I'm going to change it to orders 3 everything else is same we are going to insert 60 records with this and if the 60 records are inserted then we are going to execute the third query in which we are going to see what kind of execution is happening. Remember the third table is having round robin distribution so this time there is no hash column there is no hash distribution. Let's wait for some time this time it's going to execute logically in two different compute nodes. My query got executed so it means 60 records are actually inserted successfully. Let me delete this query from this script section and now it's the time that we have to execute our third and the final query which is going to show us that what kind of distributions are used this time. I'm going to change the table name to orders 3. I'm going to execute this query and then this time let's see what kind of output we are getting. Yes output is coming here. You can see table name is order 3 for all the records. In the node ID they are showing me that two different nodes are actually performing this operation this time. Node ID is a 29 for the first I think 30 records and for the record number 31 onwards we have another node which is playing important role it means here we have parallel executions which are happening in two different nodes which are going to be my compute nodes because the work is distributed and execution is happening parallelly this is going to be much faster than the previous one actually also you can see here distribution is actually round robin so we have a similar kind of output in the distribution some distributions are having two or three records and some distributions are actually having no records processed by that. It means it's again randomly evenly distributed across all the distributions which are available in that. Same way if I try to achieve the similar kind of thing with hash distribution then it's going to give me based on the hash column but I have to create a proper hash column for the table. I hope you understood what I'm trying to putting across with this transactional SQL queries. These queries are actually showing you that the query execution which you are doing in this SQL server is not like a traditional normal SQL server. This is a data warehouse and if this is a data warehouse you have to use the performance power of the data warehouse which can give you up to 60 compute nodes associated with this thing and one control node associated with this. So this is how you have to query, this is how you have to create a structure of your database table. I hope you are getting this. I'll see you in the next video. So as we know the dedicated SQL Server pool is actually for predictable performance and cost. Serverless SQL pool is not like that.
being serverless, in serverless SQL pool, scaling is actually done automatically to accommodate query resource requirements. It means in this case, how many control nodes and compute nodes you are going to use to execute your query, that is something which is not in your hand. This is something which is going to be taken care by Azure itself. You can see right now the topology changes over time by adding and removing more nodes or failovers. It adapts to the changes and makes sure that your query has enough resources and it finished successfully. You don't need to worry about all these things. You can just see right now in the diagram that we have one control node and on the fly when you actually execute your query, one control node is going to distribute your query using the distributed query processing engine and then it is going to decide based on the query that how many compute nodes needs to be there. Based on all those available compute nodes actually, it's going to execute that query and then again the once the query is executed, it's not going to keep all the compute nodes running. This is something which is going to be a cost effective way to run this particular query. But remember one thing, serverless SQL pool and dedicated SQL pool are totally different purpose wise. As we discussed that when we have a heavy workload like a data warehousing kind of thing, we use dedicated SQL pool. Serverless SQL pool is actually not for that. Serverless SQL pool is mostly useful for ad hoc on demand kind of queries. And that's the reason this is more or less always useful for data preparation. You always going to have maybe some unstructured semi-structured data and then maybe on top of the data you want to write some query and you want to prepare some meaningful data. Then for those kind of things you're going to use serverless SQL pool. Most of the time serverless SQL pool will allow you to create some kind of an utility object which can be a database, which can be a scope credential for the database. It will be an external data source or external file format or external table. You have a queries on screen right now. This kind of queries you can execute and you can create external resources. Even if you do not create any kind of utility objects, you will be able to execute queries on your unstructured and semi-structured data directly with the help of the master database of your serverless SQL pool. How? Let's see that thing very quickly. I am going back to my Synapse Studio. Inside the Synapse Studio, my dedicated database, which is associated with the dedicated SQL pool is always there. And I also know that thing that my serverless SQL pool database is also going to be there. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going into my resource group, which is training RG. And inside this, I have my Gen2 storage account. Inside this Gen2 storage account, I am going into my container, which is actually my file system container, Maruti FS container, which I have created. Up to this point, this container was empty. Now I want to upload some data into this and let's say this time the data is going to be in the Parquet file format. I have some folder on my machine which is, I have some files in my computer which is uh, having a Parquet data associated with that. So I'm just going to select that Parquet file and I'm going to upload this here as a blob. So this is my FS container. Inside the FS container, I'm going to upload one Parquet file right now, which is done actually. The size of the Parquet file is approximately 5 MB. It means it can have hundreds or thousands of records inside that. I hope you know Parquet is a very well extensively used format for the data storage for semi-structured way actually. So this is allowing me to store semi-structured structured data also inside that. And this is showing me that this is my Parquet file, which is actually uploaded inside my FS container. Now I'm going back to my Synapse Studio and I'm going to click on the link section. This link section is already connected with my Gen2 storage. So I'm just going to expand this and I'm going to find out the inside my FS container, do I have this Parquet file available here? It will be obviously. I have my Parquet file and if I want to get some data from this Parquet file, if I want to write some query on this Parquet file, all I have to do is I have to just right click on this. I can generate a new SQL script and you can see that I can create external table from this. I can select top thousand rows from this. I can also deal with some other operations which are available here. I'm going to first try select top hundred rows. The moment I do this thing, my query is automatically generated. It's a SQL query, which is actually trying to get hundred records from this particular file. And this time, this is not a table. This is a file. This file is actually showing me that this is trying to get data from this particular path location. And then same way, it is actually showing me that the format of the data is going to be Parquet and this is going to get this thing as a result. If I run this Parquet file, this is going to take some time and then it's going to get all the records from that Parquet file. Sorry, this is going to get only 100 records from that Parquet file and those resulted data is going to be visible here in the below section. Query is executed. 
and it's showing me that okay couple of columns like date ID, medallion ID, hanky license, pickup time ID, couple of things are there. So many columns are there and then lots of records are there which can be obviously 100 records are there and this is something which is giving me that if I want to get data for this kind of ad hoc unplanned queries then I can directly use my serverless built-in pool which is actually having a master database associated with this. Now if I want to execute this kind of ad hoc queries then it's perfectly fine that I can use this master database. But other than this if I want to execute some query from my side and if I want to create my kind of utility objects like external databases, external tables, external resources like file formats and all those things. So that also I can do here. Let's see how we can do this thing. I do not have any database here which is actually created for the serverless one. Master database is the default one. So let's do one thing. I'm going to remove this query. And in spite of this query, I'm going to execute a different query altogether. Like the first query which I want to execute is this. I want to create a database with the name data exploration DB. If I want to do further exploration for the data, then this database can help me and this can store my external objects also inside that. I'm creating a new database with some collation associated with that. I'm going to run this query. This query, okay, I have to run this query now it was by default selected this query if it is executed is going to have a new database inside my serverless sql pool actually let's see that thing it is executing or not this query is executed successfully is showing me that this create database with the name data exploration db is actually done let me refresh my page if i refresh this page and then if i go to the database section of my synapse studio this time i should have two databases this time if i go to this in the SQL databases, I should have two, you can see right now. One is my dedicated SQL pool database and the other one is not a data warehouse actually. This is a normal simple database which is created with the help of this serverless SQL. If I go to this database, you can see right now that this is not going to have any kind of tables associated with that. It can only have external tables, external resources kind of things inside that. This kind of tables cannot be here. Now what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to execute some queries on this particular database which is my serverless database. So let me say new script, empty script and this is going to execute this in the data exploration DB. Well you can create all these utility objects which I have mentioned in the previous section. So let's see that I want to create some kind of external data source right now. I am executing this query now. I'm saying that I want to create an external data source with the name contours or lake. This particular data source name is going to have association with this location which I am specifying here which is my gen2 storage dot blob dot co dot windows dot net. The moment I run this query inside this particular data exploration DB database they are going to create one external data source. You can see external resources are there, external data sources are there and inside this my contours or lake is my external data source. Now every time if I want to write a query from this particular storage account I will be able to get that thing with the help of this contours or lake kind of external data source and in my query structure I can actually use this name itself. Like for example let's say this time I want to change my query slightly differently so I'm going to do a select query but this time it's going to have a different configuration. Let's see that. Now in spite of the previous query, this time I have selected top 100 records but I am not specifying the full path. In spite of that full path, I am specifying that I want to get the data from my data source which is contours or lake. Now where is this defined? This is defined already inside the data exploration DB so that's why it's going to take the contours or lake kind of data source from that. Inside this data source which is actually my data lake storage gen 2, this is going to find for this particular path which is my FS container which is my container name and then it's going to look for nyc trip small dot parquet file which is actually my data file which is in parquet format. Format will be still parquet. Now if you want to create external file formats, if you want to create maybe this particular path as some particular external table associated with that with this particular data, you can do all this kind of utility object creation and then this is something which in one line I can say that you are actually doing data preparation. For this kind of data preparation task, you don't need to have a dedicated SQL data warehouse kind of capacity and data warehouse kind of configuration. You can anytime execute this kind of queries, you can get the results and it's going to work fine. For this kind of ad hoc queries, you can execute this query, it's going to work fine and you don't need to worry about any of the resources which are associated with that. 
I'm executing this query very soon this is going to be done you can see I'm getting the result from this particular database table and that's what which is expected this is what serverless SQL pool is all about thank you Okay, now it's the time to see the next part of uh, Azure Synapse and that is something which is known as Synapse Pipeline. If you see in this uh, Synapse Studio right now, in the left side section, we have Integrate. This Integrate is actually going to show you Synapse Pipelines. And uh, let me tell you one thing, guys. Synapse Pipeline is very similar to your Azure Data Factory Pipelines. It's even that similar that I think 90% of the things are going to be same. If you click on this plus icon, you can see that you have pipelines, you can create a new pipeline and you can give whatever name you want to give. In the left side section, we have all the activities. Your copy data activity which you have used in your Azure Data Factory, the same activities, the same kind of data flow, the integrations with Databricks or Bash services or Azure function, all the things are actually available in Synapse pipelines as it is. All the things which you have seen, like when you drag and drop your copy data activity, you have integrations of uh, data sources with the source and sync, the link services which you have created, the data sets which you have created, everything is same as it is. Some UI level changes are going to be there. For example, when I go to this manage section, I have a section called link services. When I want to create a new link service, here I'll not have only compute and data store kind of sections like data factory. You have to take care of this particular UI things where you can select different different data stores which are coming from different places where we are storing data. Or you can go with the compute section where you can integrate with Databricks or Azure functions or maybe Azure machine learning kind of things. When you're dealing with this thing, it can have a connect to a Power BI kind of uh, integrated facility available here which can be done in Azure Data Factory also. And then same way, some couple of configurations like integrating with Git configurations or trying to integrate this thing with DevOps, all these things can be done with uh, Synapse Pipeline also. Technically, Synapse Pipeline is 90% same as I said with Azure Data Factory. So this is actually nothing but same service with the package. So when you buy a package of Azure Synapse, you're actually getting Synapse Pipeline inside that integrated. Now, if you ask me one thing that, is it 100% same or it's just having some new changes in that or maybe some enhanced versions of uh, data factories there? Well, the point is, as I said, it is 90% same. Why I'm saying 90% is because there are some activities like, let me delete this activity. And there is one section here, which you can see there is there are some activities which are like notebook, spark job definition, and SQL pull store procedures, which are actually newly invented with Synapse. Because the Synapse section is invented with Synapse, this is something which is not available in Azure Data Factory. Yes, this is not going to make any uh, conceptual difference actually because conceptually Azure Data Factory and Azure Synapse Pipeline both are same but this is going to make a difference that you can use Synapse Notebook so you don't need to be dependent on the data bricks or some outside cluster kind of thing Synapse Notebooks can be triggered with Spark Pool which are integrated with this particular Synapse itself we are going to see in the coming videos that how the Synapse Notebooks are going to be working but right now you can see that you have earlier associated with the Databricks notebook same way you can have a Synapse notebook also into this one and in the settings of the Synapse notebook you can create a new notebook you can associate with those notebooks you can specify the base parameter whatever you can do technically conceptually in Databricks notebooks similar kind of things you can deal with Synapse notebooks also this one new section of this particular Synapse pipeline is going to make a difference, which is that, you know, 5-10% of difference which is there. There are so many scenarios where people are going to decide or they are going to debate on this actually, that whether Databricks notebooks are better or Synapse notebooks are better. And there are both are having pros and cons associated with that. But yes, if you're dealing with the Spark or uh, you're dealing with the Python kind of language, your Spark is going to be same, your Python language is going to be same. Some utility-wise changes are going to be there in between these two.
And if you compare Azure Synapse pipeline with the Azure Data Factory pipeline, I always believe that 90% things are same. Only this one new section is going to be there. If you really know use of this thing in your projects and all, you don't need to worry about this. Everything what you do in Azure Data Factory, you can do this thing in Synapse pipeline, the same configuration, nothing new. So that is what Synapse pipeline is all about. I request you, if possible, whatever practical samples you have tried in Azure Data Factory module, you can try those things here also and that's going to work same way. The only differences are this, that some additional configurations are going to be there. If you go to manage, you can see that in the link services, there are some one or two link services which by default they have configured with my dedicated SQL pool of my data warehouse and my Gen2 storage account. But this is something which we can also create manually, so that's not a big deal. That's not something which is a change. It's just some additional configurations are coming pre-built inside this Synapse pipeline. I hope you get this and you're going to try certain practical stuff with this. Thank you. Now the next topic which we are going to see in this video is Azure Synapse Link. But Azure Synapse Link is actually connected with one more topic which is known as HTAP. This HTAP stands for Hybrid Transactional Analytical Processing. I'm sure you guys have heard about OLAP, Online Analytical Processing. HTAP is actually, you know, a better enhanced way to do analytical processing actually. What is this? Let's, let's see that thing. Azure Synapse Link for Azure Cosmos DB is a cloud native hybrid transactional and analytical processing capability that enables you to run near real time analytics over operational data in Azure Cosmos DB. In simple words, somewhere if you have a data stored in your Azure Cosmos DB and if you want that you are going to do some analytical queries on that data with the help of Azure Synapse, then you need to link this data store with your Synapse. In spite of using a normal link service kind of thing, you're going to use a specialized link service which is known as Azure Synapse Link actually. This Azure Synapse Link is going to help you to build a tightly seamless integration between Azure Cosmos DB and Azure Synapse Analytics. Now let's try to understand this thing with some visualized way. Let's say you have Azure Cosmos DB and Azure Synapse both deployed somewhere on your Azure portal. Cosmos DB is obviously going to have your data on which maybe you want to do some transactional workload and you want to execute some queries and there are maybe some applications and devices which are actually trying to do some transactional workloads on your operational data in the Cosmos DB. When this kind of thing is happening, we do not want that this transactional workload, this performance is going to be impacting on my analytical things also. We also want that when we write analytical queries, that should not impact on the transactional workload. When we want that our analytical processing is not going to be impacting on our transactional workload, at that time we have to make sure that we need to associate this thing with HTAP, Hybrid Transactional Analytical Processing. Now what this is actually doing, this is going to create some analytical store for my data which is there in Cosmos DB. So whatever data you have in your Cosmos DB, that data is going to be replicated and stored inside this analytical store in Azure Synapse. The linking between these two is going to enable this seamless integration which is going to happen on almost near real time. The moment some data is going to be changed in Cosmos DB, it will be reflected and configured inside the Synapse. And that is something which is going to be taking care when you're going to write queries on that. How the Synapse link is going to be configured in Cosmos DB, how you're going to integrate this thing and how you're going to write queries in Azure Synapse Analytics, this is all we are going to see in this particular video. Before this, let's try to understand one last part of this theoretical concept. Now, to analyze large operational data sets while minimizing the impact of the performance of mission critical transaction workload, that is something which is a benefit of Azure Synapse Link. Traditionally, the operational data in Azure Cosmos DB is extracted and processed by ETL, Extract Transform Load kind of pipeline. So yes, you can create a, your Synapse pipeline or Data Factory pipelines and you can get data from Cosmos DB. This ETL pipeline requires many layers of data movement, resulting in much operational complexity and even the performance impact on your transactional workload, which we don't want. It also going to increase the latency to analyze the operational data from the time of origin 
this is not going to be a real time but Synapse link is going to be a near real time kind of thing. When compared to this traditional ETL based solution, Azure Synapse link for Azure Cosmos DB offers several advantages such as it reduces the complexity of no ETL jobs because we can directly write queries. It's going to be near real time insight into your operational data. No impact on operational workload. Optimize for large scale analytical workloads because separate analytical stores are going to be created. And it's also going to be a cost effective way to write your queries and performing some analytical operations on that. How is it going to work? Let's see this thing in action. But in this case, we have to do two steps. First, we have to set up our Cosmos DB with some data. And once that is set up, then we have to enable Synapse link. And then only we can write queries with the help of hybrid transactional analytical processing. This is very important concept if you are going to be a data engineer and if you are planning for Azure certifications on data engineer, this concept you have to be very clear with. Let's focus on this practically. I'm there in my Azure portal. My Synapse Studio is already created in the previous videos actually. I'm going to click on create resource and without wasting time, I'm going to create my first Azure Cosmos DB. For your kind information, Azure Cosmos DB supports multiple APIs. It's a multi-model database of Microsoft. So you can choose which API you want to go for. In this video, we are going to select SQL because that's most recommended and preferable one for most of the scenarios. I'm going to click on create. We are going to select our subscription. We are going to select our resource group, which is going to be training RG. And then we are going to say this is going to be my Cosmos DB account. I'm just putting my name before that. So I'm specifying this is going to be unique. So this is my Cosmos DB account. Remember one Cosmos DB account can have multiple Cosmos DBs inside that. The location for this I can keep anything. I'm going to choose East US which is same like my Synapse. And then uh, I do not want to apply any free tier discount. We can provision throughput as per the configuration. Uh, actually higher throughput is one of the biggest advantage of Cosmos DB. The throughput wise, performance wise, Cosmos DB is much, much, much better than any other database, including SQL Server database hosted on Azure Cloud. The throughput which Cosmos DB is supporting is literally unlimited, actually. We are going to go with some limited total amount of throughput here because I do not want to waste much my Azure credits in this. So this is fine. Uh, everything else is fine with the default configuration in all the tabs. I'm just going to click on review plus create. And if the validation is going to pass, we are going to click on create. As mentioned here, the estimated account creation time is two minutes. So we have to wait for this particular time. Uh, while we are waiting for this deployment should be done, I want you to remember two things about Cosmos DB. First thing is, this is very, very high throughput. This is performance wise, very good database, which I already mentioned. Second thing is Cosmos DB is actually Microsoft's own database. So you cannot deploy Cosmos DB other than Azure Cloud. It is only limited to Azure Cloud actually. And that is something which is giving you this kind of a higher throughput because it's Microsoft's own database hosted on their own cloud. They have a full control on the throughput of this thing and that's why they can give you best performance on this. This also count like a limitation that you cannot go outside the Azure cloud. Some people also count this thing as a, a limitation that you cannot go outside the Azure cloud. You have to be in the Azure cloud only. But yeah, that is something which is a matter of choice. The deployment of my database is completed now. Let's click on go to resource. First thing first, inside the Cosmos DB account, I need to create my first database. Let me click on my data explorer. It's showing me some introductory video, which I'm not interested in right now. So we are going to close that. And then this is a section where it's showing me that we have created this Cosmos DB account with SQL kind of a model. So this is an SQL API, which is integrated with that. I am going to click on this drop down, and I'm going to click on that. I want to create a new database. Initially, when you create a database, uh, you can give whatever name you want to give. Let's say we are specifying a name of the database that this is something which is learning DB. This learning DB is just going to have some dummy data right now. Uh, I'm giving a name learning DB and uh, what kind of throughput I want to provision with this. I'm saying I want that is going to be a manual throughput, which is going to be minimum, which is actually 400 request unit per second. So per second, we can make 400 requests to the data access, which is fine for me right now. And uh, I'm going to click on OK. Once this one database is created, this database can have multiple 
you know, I can say containers inside that. So I know that people who are familiar with SQL Server, they'll not be comfortable with this. But in this case, we do not have tables. When you have Cosmos DB, Cosmos DB is actually going to have containers inside that. So you can see learning DB database is created. I can click on this and I can create a new container. This container is going to have multiple documents inside that. And each document is going to be like a one single record. I'm creating a new container. Let's say my container ID is uh, students. I want to store some students data inside this. Uh, I can specify my kind of partition key here. I can specify ID or any other column also as a partition key. I'm specifying ID only. Students ID is going to be unique and it's going to divide the partitions with that. So I'm going to find with that. And then this is something which is very important. When you create a Cosmos DB, there is a section here which is disabled right now, which is analytical store. And you can see it is mentioned here that Azure Synapse link is required for creating analytical store. As of now, I'm creating container which is not having analytical store inside that. But yeah, I'm going to do this thing after creation of this. So let's click on create right now. One database learning DB is created. Inside that one container students is going to be created. And this students container can have multiple records inside that. So this is going to contain the records in the form of uh, JSON documents actually. I'm quickly going to create some documents in that. So this is students container. If I click on items, right side I have a section that there are no items right now in this. Uh, let me create a new item. Let me specify that the ID of my student is going to be let's say S713. Uh, this is going to be the ID of the student. I want to specify a few more details for the student like name of the student. Let's say name of the student is going to be Rahul. And then I'm going to specify he belongs to a school. So I'm going to specify the school of Rahul is going to be let's say uh, Microsoft. And the moment if you see here, this is actually showing me error because somewhere I forgot to do the comma. This is going to do all the validations of the JSON data actually right now. If it is not proper, it's going to give you that now yeah, this is something which is not proper actually. I'm going to specify one more comma now and then I'm going to say that uh, I want one more thing which is class. Rahul is in the class 9th let's say. And this is what the data which I want to store here. Once I have the data, I'm going to click on save. And the moment I click on save, Cosmos DB is going to create some automatically generated columns inside this particular document. This is going to be used internally by Cosmos DB. But for me, the important thing is right now, in the left side column, I got one new record, which is actually nothing but one document, which is storing my student's data. Let me quickly add some more new items. I'm going to specify that the second student is having 714. His name is John. And John also studies in MS. No, he studies in DPS, let's say. And then he's studying in class number five. And then I'm going to say save. The new record is saved. Let me add one more. And uh, let me add myself in this. I'm going to say this is student number 715. Uh, the name of the student is uh, Maruti is learning online so no school and then uh, it's class number seven let's say and then i'm going to click on save the moment i do this my students are added here their unique ids are actually stored here and this is something which is my data now up to this point it's just like we are dealing with the normal cosmos db database if you want to enable synapse link in this on the top of this particular configuration you can see there is a button enable azure synapse link I'm going to click on this button and they are saying enable Azure Synapse link on this Cosmos DB. We're using this, you can get uh, near real-time kind of analytics. It's going to help you to segregate your analytical workload with the transaction workload. This is all we discuss actually. And for more information, you can click on learn more. Right now, I'm going to click on enable Azure Synapse link. This process is just initiated right now. And uh, you can see this is going to take some time actually. So in order to understand this, that how much time it is taking and whether it's done or not, in the left side column, I have to scroll down to this section, which is Azure Synapse link. When I click on that, it's going to show me that account is updating. This can take some time. This can take few seconds actually. So you just have to wait here till it is showing you account is updating or it is enabled after that. 
and uh, let's wait for this sometime if it is not going to reflect it immediately you can refresh your browser let me refresh my browser once I refresh this browser it's still showing me account is updating I'll wait for a few more seconds and then again I'll refresh it should show me account is enabled in order to proceed further first it should be enabled so let's just wait for this to be done I'm refreshing one more time Yes, for me now it is showing me account is enabled and you can see it's showing me that this database and this container which you have, you can enable Azure Synapse link for this. The moment I say I want to enable this for a particular container or database, they are going to create one analytical store in the background. And using that analytical store, the Azure Synapse link is going to perform analytical query separately. Let me check mark this and I'm going to say enable synapse link on these containers actually. I have only one container. You can have multiple also. Depends upon the data of that container is going to take time. It can take few minutes or even it can take few hours if you have a huge amount of data. I'm going to say enable synapse link on these containers and now as it is mentioned here, this can take some time. This can take some time depends upon the data. I do not have much data. I just have few records. So I will just uh, wait for some time and then after that it should be done. So it started right now. It's showing me 25% done. If I wait for a few more minutes, it's going to be done fully. So let's just wait for that. It will be completed very soon. Yeah, now it's showing me 99% done. Um, it's going to be done within few seconds now. Okay, for me this is done. You can see it's showing me now. Process is completed. Uh, it's showing me Azure Synapse link has already been enabled on some container here showing me the green tick it means I'm good to go if this is done this is the time we have to use this connection we have to use this analytical store which is configured in the background using this into our synapse so let's go to that I'm going into my synapse studio right now inside the synapse studio left side we have a section called data and uh, in this data we have a section which is actually linked uh, whatever link data stores are there is going to be visible here whatever actual data stores are there is going to be visible here uh, workspace kind of thing let me do one thing let me refresh this first let's just see this thing that right now we do not have any connections established with any cosmos db kind of thing so you can see that in the workspace there is nothing in this link there is nothing it's just one thing which is my gen2 storage account what i'm going to do is i'm going to click on this plus icon and then I'm going to select that I want to connect to some external data. This is actually your Synapse link, which is coming in this link section actually. The moment I try to connect with the external data, this is not like a normal link service where you can have all the plenty of data stores available in this. In this case, you will have only these five options which are there. And what we are going to select right now is Azure Cosmos DB with SQL API, this one. Once I select this and click on continue, it's going to ask me what will be the name of this. I'm going to give a name of this. This is Cosmos DB. It's a link service actually, but I'm going to give a name that this is my Cosmos DB Synapse link. So I'm going to say this is going to be my Synapse link. Description can be anything. Auto resolve integration runtime is fine. I'm going to select my subscription, my Cosmos DB account and my database student should come in that. So yeah, sorry, learning DB should come in that. This is my database name. I'm going to click on taste connection connection successful and I'm going to click on create the moment you do this thing you have to observe something like if this is successfully done the synapse link is going to be enabled between synapse and cosmos db and if that is successfully created like this all you have to do is just refresh this this studio once once you refresh this thing in the link databases you will get one cosmos db here you can see I got one Cosmos DB database. If I expand this inside the Cosmos DB database, we have students, which is nothing but my container. And what I want you to observe here is this students container, which is created here, is having a special kind of an icon in that. Just remember, guys, this is something which is an icon, which is actually for HTAP enable containers. If this is not enabled with hybrid transactional analytical processing, then this three bars which are there in this particular icon is not going to be there in that. It's going to show you only a simple icon like three squares or something like that. This is something which is smartly you can understand that this is HTAP enable container or this is a normal container, something like that. In this case, this is HTAP enable container. Using this icon, I can understand that thing. And now if I want to write some queries on this, or if I want to generate some notebooks on this, all these things can be possible. 
I can just click on this new SQL script. I can try to select some top 100 rows. It's going to generate some query which will not work directly. But yes, I need to provide some configurational things here. So I got this query generated where on the first line they are saying that they are trying to look for some credentials. Obviously, everything is going to be a secure communication between Synapse Link and Cosmos DB. So I have to specify some credentials. Let's say I'm giving a name of this thing that this is my Maruti Cosmos cred. This is going to be the name of the credential which I'm going to create. It can be anything. I do not want to throw any exception for the database operation. So this is fine. I just want to delete the line number two. In the create credential, this is going to be the name of the credential which I want to create. And then while writing the query for the select top 100 also, I'm saying this is going to be my credential which I'm going to use to connect with this Cosmos DB account and inside that this database. The last and final thing which is required here is I have to provide my shared access signature. I hope you remember SAS tokens which we have used in storage account. Similar kind of secrets and tokens are available in Cosmos DB also. I'm just going to provide one of the secret here, which is going to allow me to access that Cosmos DB data. Let me go back to Cosmos DB. There is a section here called keys. And in this key sections, you can take either primary key or secondary key, which you can copy and you can put it here as a shared access signature. Using this signature, they can validate my query. And then uh, let's see if it is working or not. Let me click on run. This will try to get some records from students. If everything is work fine, if Synapse link is configured properly, this is going to perform some query without affecting my transactional workload. And that's going to show me some data here. Let's wait for some time. Yep, you can see that my three students which I have added here, Maruti, Rahul, John, all are actually available here. I can query my Cosmos DB seamlessly and uh, even if I change some data into that Cosmos DB, it will be reflected here. I hope you are able to understand this. Last but not the least, I just want to click on publish all so that this SQL script 1 is going to be saved, which maybe I can use further also. I'm going to click on publish, it's successfully saved and we are good. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Okay, now it's the time to see Azure Synapse Notebooks, actually. Uh, we have seen Azure Synapse SQL, we have seen Synapse Studio, we have seen Synapse Pipeline as well as just now in the previous video, you have seen Synapse Link also. The last and the final part of uh, Synapse Studio is actually Synapse Notebooks. Now you can see right now, there are multiple ways to create notebooks here, actually. First, I can go to this develop section and when I go to the develop, like I can create my SQL scripts, I have an option to create a notebook here. But actually, before I create a notebook, I have to create something which is known as Apache Spark Pull. These notebooks are very similar conceptually to your Databricks notebook. Actually, work-wise, both are having so many similarities because both are based on Spark. Both can support various languages like Python, Scala, and in this case, this notebooks of Synapse can support C Sharp also. Now, when you have this kind of similarities, uh, there is one thing which is also common, like normally Databricks notebooks were working based on your Databricks cluster. Here, the Synapse notebooks are going to be working based on something which is known as Synapse pull. So before you create a notebook, actually, let's go back to your Azure portal. As you can see here, I do not have any Apache Spark pull, but in order to run any notebooks, I need to create one. So let's click on new Apache Spark pull. I'm going to provision one Spark pull. Let's say the name of the Spark pull I'm giving Maruti SPRK pull one. This is going to be my Spark pull one. Uh, it's asking me, do I want to enable isolated compute? Well, if I want some dedicated isolated computes, then I can enable this thing. Uh, but I don't want this right now. Also, this is a facility which is not available in all the subscriptions. So there are chances in your subscription isolated compute will not be available. So let's not go with that. Uh, I can select my node size and node size family, which is nothing but my virtual machine size actually. To simplify the virtual machine size and compute, they have given sizes here, which is very similar to t-shirt size, 
we have small medium large extra large and double XL kind of things I'm going to go with the small size pool right now which is going to have auto scale well no I do not want auto scale I want a manual scaling and then let's say I want to go with the minimum number of nodes which is actually three remember the maximum number of nodes which you can create here is 200 I'm going with the three nodes which is minimum and it's showing me that this is going to have estimated price per hour which is going to be 119 INR which is fine for me I'm going with this configuration I'm going to click on this next section which is having additional settings I do not want to change anything but same like the termination period kind of thing here we have automatic pausing like uh, if you're not using your spark pull continuously after few minutes it will be pause and then when it is pause it's not going to cost you we have a version options for Apache Spark, Python, Scala and whatever languages and uh, architectures which are supported by Sparkpool. We have one very important topic here, Delta Lake. The 1.2 version of Delta Lake is also supported with the Sparkpool, which we are going to f figure out in the next module of this course. And it's one of the very interesting thing. But yeah, this is all we have here. We are not going to change anything. I'm going to click on review plus create. And if the validations are passed, I'm just going to start deployment of this Apache Spark pool. This Spark pool with this three node which I have configured will be useful to run my notebooks. And while this is going on, let's see how we can create a notebook. So this is going on here. In the Snap Studio, I am going to specify that I can create a new notebook. Now you have three options here. You can choose this new notebook kind of option and it's going to create a new notebook without a second. And uh, you can see right side I have a notebook name on the top it's asking me that you want to attach to which particular pool my spark pool is not ready right now it's under provisioning so it's not coming here but very soon it will come and these four languages are actually supported I can choose one of them and I can write it same like your Databricks cluster you can add markdowns you can add the code directly here inside the cells and then if you want to run all the cells you're going to click on run all and if you want to run particular cells you can click on run cell particularly like this when I have this kind of cell every cell is going to have piece of logic this kind of multiple cells or multiple markdowns I can add if I want to uh, arrange this thing I can just uh, specify some configurations here and then uh, I can I can just uh, you know move certain things customize certain things as per my configuration now in spite of writing some code in this notebook from scratch I am going to do two things first there are two options here actually first thing is here I can click on this plus icon and I can import my existing notebooks actually like you can do export import in the Databricks notebooks also here also you can have import and export kind of options and let me do one thing let me go to my particular folder quickly which is Azure Synapse and then from that I am going to take one of my spark transformation kind of notebook which I want to import here you can see this is the same notebook which I have imported in my Databricks classes actually and uh, you can see this is going to have the same kind of almost 23 uh, cells inside that each cell is actually showing me that what exact configurations I have done in this now this spark transformation are having spark based configuration inside that and the code wise whatever code we have written in those spark transformations will work as it is same here let me see if my spark pool is deployed yes it is deployed I can click on the spark pool I can select my spark pool here and then once I select my spark pool if I want to run this notebook all I have to do is I have to click on run all when I click on run all initially this is going to take some time to connect to my spark pool to create a session for this one this is going to take some time so you can see that this is initiated and the timer is started but this is not the time taken by executing this one particular cell this is the time taken to start the session so please wait for a few minutes while your session start one session is started once your pool is connected with this notebook then only this is going to start executing this thing and after that all these executions are just matter of some fraction of seconds only you can see now it's showing me that uh, my session is ready it took almost two minutes I fast forwarded that and this first cell itself is actually uh, running from last three minutes four minutes now almost let's wait now it is actually starting the execution of the cells and it's going to go one by one 
let's wait for this cells to be executed yeah you can see this is done now and it took almost four minutes to start the session and initiate this thing um, now the second cell is taking seven eight seconds it's going to execute the core job executions are done it's actually creating uh, two executors job execution is in progress it is actually executed by two executors which are using eight cores that is visible here 20 seconds are passed for this particular section then the next one is done in one second then the moving down one second one second these all things are actually executed in one one seconds actually it's very super fast and uh, if i process progress this thing this is something which is like uh, it's going to be executed with the same kind of a pace. Now, I do not want to go through this full notebook right now, but yeah, this is something like this, that this particular notebook is actually running right now. It's going to done. You can see everything is executed. Okay, all the cells which are there inside this are executed within a few seconds, actually. All 23 cells are done. Once this is done, it's like uh, this particular notebook is successfully executed. The same code, you can compare this notebook code. This is the same code which was available in our Databricks notebook. We have imported here and it's working fine. Yes, the only difference which is here is this is actually my different extension kind of notebook. You will find this notebook in the course. Okay, so exactly after this video, you are going to have the notebook which you can use and import. Exactly after this video, you will find this notebook which you can import and you can use the same way I did here. Now, other than this notebook, I also want you to guide in Azure Synapse, Microsoft has given you one very useful section which is known as Gallery. You can see here when I click on the plus icon, we have Browse Gallery section. This Browse Gallery section is going to give you lots of ready-made notebooks here. You can also have a look at uh, SQL scripts and the pipeline templates which they have given here. Lots of useful things are there. I personally request if possible, go through this notebook section. You can filter your choice of languages here. And then there are a couple of useful notebooks which are available here, which are actually giving you a lots of insight. Like you can use this one using Azure Open Data Set in Synapse, or you can use a simplest notebook in the PySpark. Like let me select only PySpark here. In spite of choosing the language, I'm selecting only one language here. And maybe I want to go with creating and manage Spark table. If you want to kickstart your journey in the notebook kind of section, you can just click on one of the notebook like this, click on continue. You can see whatever managed Spark table they want to create here using Spark SQL are actually mentioned here. And it's just a very simple straightforward notebook with three, four cells inside that. You can click on open notebook. You can attach it with your Spark pool and then you can use the same way I did here. Thank you.